Hello and welcome to the Grand Touring Motorsports Podcast, Break, Fix, where we're always fixing to break into something motorsports related. Yeah! Hey everybody, I'm Steve. And I'm Izzy. And we're with Everything, Everything I Learned from movies. movies. And tonight! Oh, tonight. Rum, 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 rum. We're talking car movies with Break, Fix. Woo! That's right. Tonight, 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 in one of the ultimate no prep showdowns of the year, we attempt to pit original versus remake in a best of car adjacent movies drag race. That's right. And the movie buffs, Steve and Izzy from Everything I Learned from Movies, are joining us tonight on this car nerds versus movie buffs break fix crossover episode. So, why don't we get this drag race started? Wait, we're not racing for pinks, are we? I'm not sure. That's up to them. Look, I got a lot to put on the line here. I drove a 96 Honda Accord. and <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm very sorry for you. <laughs> I, I got some Hot Wheels. <laughs> oh, I just found my micro machines. So. Yeah, there we go. Uh, I can talk almost as fast as the micro machines guy. I'm getting close these days. You know, it, it's the Red Bull. It really does Sometimes you can talk really, really fast, especially if you've had a couple of good drinks. But yeah. <laughs> so let's hit the stage a little bit. Let's hit the rules. Just like our What Should I Buy episodes. I think this one deserves a little bit of context for our listeners just like in the car world the movie world is often debated you know new versus old is star wars episode one just as good as a new hope or you know vice versa the answer is yeah maybe but in some cases absolutely not the rule of sequels comes into play the joel schumacher versions of batman were terrible and we all know that the tim burton ones are fantastic i'm just going to leave it at that that being said Cars are also remade over and over again in their original image and sometimes, you know, morphed into something completely reimagined, but they're always sequels. So are they better? And so let's try to answer those questions about car related movies and whether they are better. And let's talk about the cars that are featured in those films. Steven, Izzy, why don't you kick us off? What do you want to talk about first? Look, if you guys are going to sit around here and justify the Bronco 2, I'm out. Uh, (laughs) No, but I want to correct Eric on something. These aren't sequels to the original movies. These are remakes. This is like a new Thunderbird. I mean, yeah. Well, we'll talk about it. You guys heard our uh, Gone in 60 Seconds episodes, kind of how we were introduced. Uh, Absolutely. Let's start with the old versus new for Gone in 60 Seconds. Absolutely. And we too did a movie mix bag episode where we talked about the original Gone in 60 Seconds. And that movie (laughs) was trash. It's tragic. It really is. I mean, it's it's akin to the Red Holy Death, crap. right? The DMV safety videos they used to show you in like the 80s and stuff. Like this might happen to you if you don't wear your seatbelt. <laughs> that that means- movie is if GTM members had an unlimited budget and said, hey, let's make a movie. And, and by then- unlimited, you mean 20 grand. <laughs> and a six pack. <laughs> oh, and about 15 Mustangs. Oh, yeah, yeah, true. But, but, but it was back in the 70s, so you could get them for like $2,000. That's true. And legend has it, according to our researcher, right? We always have to fact check some of the stuff we do. There was only one Mustang used in that movie. It's the same pile of crap through that oh. entire 90 minutes. Yeah. Oh, wow. Even Dukes of Hazard had a couple spares. They had like 79 chargers they used over the course of that show. Yeah. <laughs> And there's another one to talk about remakes and sequels there too. The oh, Dukes yeah. of Hazard. <laughs> Jessica well, Simpson. Hutch, uh, oh yeah. God. Oh, that was terrible. But Snoop Dogg was Huggy Bear. When Starsky yeah, met Hutch. <laughs> so let's reference for those that don't know the 1970s classic Gone in 60 Seconds. H.B. Halecki used a 74 Mustang, which actually wasn't a Mach 1, but he modified to look like one, which was the hot ticket upgrade package for the Mustang at that time. And he did all his own stunts, much like Jackie Chan, Jason Statham, and Tom Cruise. But it didn't turn out so well for Eleanor at the end of the movie, as you guys, you know, kind of walked that through for the audience. And most people can't stand to make it through that film. But when Gone in 60 Seconds with Nicolas Cage came out, I think they just turned the whole thing on its nose. 67 GT500 Mustang, where'd that come from? I mean, Eleanor, the original one, wasn't one of those. Does that make it better? Does it make it worse? I don't know if the acting was any better in the second movie. What about uh, you? Oh, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh. Academy Award winner Nicolas Cage as Memphis Reigns. We yeah, almost she... named our cats after that <laughs> character. Uh, said we named uh... Cameron and Poe. You know? <laughs> <laughs> 
did Nicolas Cage come into himself yet at that point yeah, compared to other after movies? After The Rock and Con Air and yeah. Face Off. And, oh, yeah, Leaving Las Vegas, which he won an Academy Award for. Yeah, yeah. And this yeah, was he's... before, you know, the, the downturn. Yeah. The divorces. Yeah. The divorces <laughs> of the this was his heyday. Yeah, right. this is peak I... Nicolas Cage action star. Are you kidding me? This is like the end of the peak. This is like national treasure, Nicolas Cage. This is how he earned all his money to buy all those castles and shit. Yeah, I mean, like T-Rex skulls, skulls and, yeah. <laughs> and, and various wives from other nations. And yeah. And, and I hear the Ferrari in National Treasure was his too. So a little bit of millionaire trivia there. Yeah. Before the bill collectors took it. And the, uh, <laughs> it was. And the pyramid that he purchased for the, uh, the sequel that didn't get made. Oh yeah, National Treasure 3, St. <laughs> Louis Cathedral number one. Check it out. You know, no, I would have watched that movie because I was a big fan of the first two. So hey, I'm just saying. Yeah. Right? Everybody I'd still us. watch it. I should probably let the listeners at home know that uh Nicolas Cage is the probably the patron saint of our podcast. <laughs> we have interviewed his brother, a bunch of his directors, his stand-in. So we're coming for you, Nick. We're kind of circling around. He's standing. Eventually he'll get wind, I think. Wait, what what exactly are you what exactly are you circling though? That's what I want to know. Oh, we're the dream. Nicolas Cage. We, we're, we're, I'm uh, sorry, we are orbiting Nicolas Cage and eventually yeah. we're gonna crash through that atmosphere and boom. Yeah. Since you're a satellite or moon around Nicolas Cage, is there a, is there a name for this? Steve, what is the name of our podcast? <laughs> from movies and all the major podcatchers. And follow us at EILF Movies on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Brilliant. So, <laughs> also, Steve's nickname is Shit Plugger Steve because he will plug our shit anywhere. That's right. Nice. Oh, and then I mentioned Patreon because it's just $2 a month. Anyway. But I have to say, I, Nicolas Cage is so desperate right now. I'm surprised that he hasn't actually called you guys to come on your show. Look, look. Oh, he's no. far too busy to be talking yeah, to yeah, us. No. But, uh... Here's the thing. Everybody thinks he's desperate. Yeah. Nicolas Cage is really at a really interesting point in his career because he's free to do all these little movies. He is doing so many characters right now. Don't free to do, like has movie. to do. Oh, no. He's, oh. he's going through and like choosing wildly different characters and putting yeah. the Nick Cage spin on them. Like, if you keep watching these, he's doing some really, really interesting stuff. And by the way, guys, think of it this way. If he were to do, you know, National Treasure 3 and get $20 million, how much of that does he actually get? Five. How many, uh, you know, compared to his ex-wives and managers? Oh, well, and yeah, yeah. It's, a tr- it's like trickle-down Reaganomics yeah. at that so point. He's you know? like just getting enough to get by, you know, the, the yeah. tax man or whatever is like, well, we can't have this guy living out of a shoebox, you know? He's like the uh, the Hollywood version of Michael Strahan. He had to keep playing in the NFL to appease his ex-wives. Yeah, or he, yeah. or he just goes wherever Wesley Snipes went after Demolition Man. You know, <laughs> it'll be okay in twenty years. It'll be fine. Two steps ahead of the tax man. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> but, but yeah, he's able to express himself in different ways, do all these odd things that he wouldn't be able to do if he was, I don't know, playing Nick Fury or something in the Avengers movies or something. <laughs> like yeah, that. He, he gets to do a lot of different characters. I'm gonna point to uh, Willy's Wonderworld. W- Willy's yes. Wonderland. Willy's Wa- Wonderland. That's yeah. it. Or, that or it was Willy's, uh, that movie is amazing, and he doesn't say a word. I think where he's peaked though now for me is that what is it the history of curse words or whatever he did on that Netflix? was good stuff <laughs> that was yeah. fantastic some best I'd comedy say the ever first two or three episodes were fantastic and then it kind of went on <laughs> yeah and that was not Nick Cage's fault that was the writer's fault yeah. you could tell where they lost steam and were just making having fun the whole premise of that show was around fuck and then they didn't know what to do after that 100 yeah, so like, percent. wait is dick a bad word <laughs> <laughs> we're so gonna talk about back. heck yeah. so going back to this drag race between the, the original oh, gone yeah, in 60 yeah. seconds yeah <laughs> <laughs> sorry, wait, is that what we're doing here <laughs> Memphis so, so going back, so, to, back to the drag race i love rupaul what <laughs> yes but the reason i say <laughs> is the new one better than the old one and yes. is the acting any better in the new one than the old one yes is, well i'll put it this way the old one didn't have much in the way of dialogue and in those old 70s movies that's not necessarily a bad thing if you've ever watched the movie le mans by steve mcqueen there's about three minutes of acting and talking in a three-hour movie and it's glorious and yeah. more, more of those old films should be that way however when you get to the new gone in 60 seconds there's just some really just i want to say cringy stuff with giovanni ribisi and uh you know what's her face <laughs> angelina yes. julie yes what but, sway or whatever her name yeah, is but what Look. gets me is is nick cage basically acting much like a young william shatner like every time i watch that movie i'm like there's a car 
in a sea container. Oh, let's get it. And you're just like, come on, man. What is this? He's playing the straight man, the deep one. Yep. He's he's lived too much life already. Yeah, they all can't be, you know, Delroy Lindo and Robert Duvall and <laughs> Chai McBride. Both movies, though, are very much of their time. Yeah, oh, like, yeah. 100%. I know you guys are, absolutely. like, looking at Gone in 60 Seconds as, like, a new movie, but that movie's, like, 25 <laughs> yeah. years old yeah, now. It's, it's, yeah, what, 2000, I think, when it came there out? There are people yeah. listening to this podcast that were born after that movie came out. <laughs> Did you see the uh, the road sign on the way into the podcast that says Boomtown, exit now? Yeah. <laughs> welcome welcome to Boomerville. You're here. Boomtown. That's all right. I'm pretty sure we're geriatric millennials at this point. <laughs> I thought we were elder millennials. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Xenials. I would say, if we're going to put some numbers on this, I'd say off the line, big old burnout. Both of them hit you in the face right away. I mean, big clouds of oh. smoke from both movies. They get your attention. I think in the eighth mile, they're pretty much tied in terms of satisfaction and entertainment. But when it comes down to what did you get out of the movie at the end? Uh, my vote is the new one wins and so does the new Eleanor. And for one big reason, nobody has a picture of a 74 Mach 1 Mustang on their bedroom wall. I think everybody of our generation probably and still has a picture of the GT500 Eleanor in their garage or in their wall or somewhere in their house. Yeah, that's a good point. Oh, yeah. yeah. Would you guys agree? I think the new one definitely wins over the old one. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah it, it's yeah. got like the jokes. Like, like it's very 90s, but it's a fun 90s. Yeah, it has like a hacker's element to it with cars. Exactly. Sure exactly. It, I was a certain age when it came out. I'm 100% in. <laughs> <laughs> it still holds up now, though. I will agree. I mean, both have their place in cinematic history. I mean, the original Gone in 60 Seconds for everything that went into that movie, the mass amounts of illegal things they did in that movie. When you really dive into that film, it's a big wow factor. And we do cover it on that other episode. So, you know, I'm not going to belabor that point. So I think both of them have their place in history, much like an old Mustang drag racing against a new one, right? It's cool to see them side by side. But I think we got to move on to another film that's just as awkward. But before we move on, so the if we're keeping score, the new movie is up by one, and the old movies are down to zero still, right? Yes. Just make sure we keep keep track of that. And now we'll continue. So Vanishing Point. Vanishing Point! Yeah! The original Vanishing Point with the 70 Challenger and the naked girl yeah. riding a motorcycle. Oh, yeah! That That's shit. pretty hard to beat. That I'm not movie gonna lie. is amazing. I wanted to be Kowalski. And I was born 20 years too late for that. Your dad was Kowalski. Oh, yeah. My though. dad was probably Kowalski at one point. Steve's dad was a canine cop. Yeah. He had the aviators and the mustache. So picture that movie, but with a dog in the seat. And that was Steve's dad. <laughs> so I agree with you. And it's another one of those 70s films where the amount of dialogue is next to zero. I mean, yeah, how many yeah. times does Barry Newman actually talk in that movie, if at all? Right? Yeah, yeah. The, the the talking versus nudity in that movie. It's like, yeah, they're both about five minutes and the rest is just, you know. Beautiful. And that motorcycle scene can be deleted and it doesn't take away from the film. Um, but, oh, of course mm, but it does add having it in. But it adds True. Really but, much value. But you know what does really bring it home for me though is like the uh, i can't remember the name of the guy who was the, in the radio booth and was kind of egging him on and giving him all the oh, pointers. Yeah. Immediately my mind goes to Pootie Tang, right? It's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I didn't love that movie. <laughs> Chop it, tow. <laughs> so yeah, the other run it can. Why tow? But in the other corner, in in lane number two, is an actual remake of the '70s Vanishing Point with Viggo Mortensen and Jason Priestley. I haven't seen this one. I can't seem to like really find it anywhere streaming, but found out about this uh, like a year or two ago. And I was like, holy shit, Vigo did this? I, I yeah, gotta see I it. I realize you hadn't seen that. Who I think this is like that Sinbad Kazam movie. That, like, it doesn't <laughs> exist, but everybody <laughs> thinks it exists and they've seen it. We all saw that movie. It's legit. <laughs> yes, we did. It's a conspiracy. So I happened to see this movie and I think I have a copy somewhere. I gotta go dig it up. And I will say when the cars pull up to the Christmas tree, it's the same car. It's not Chrysler used this as an excuse to debut the new Challenger because it was too early for that, right? The new Challenger didn't come out until the 2000s. So here we are in 1997 and yet another 70, 71 Challenger RT in white, same thing. It's the same story. It's a literal remake. It's not even a sequel. It's not even reimagined. There's more dialogue. Vigo Mortensen plays a role. <laughs> it's, I'm going to just put it that way. 
But Jason Priestley plays Kowalski in the movie. And oh. if, you ha- if you've seen the original movie, it ends pretty much the same way. Nothing really earth shattering there. It was just like, hey, did you guys hear about this film that we did in the 70s? Oh, no? Well, here, check this one out. Well, okay. So it sounds like the original is going to take this one far off in a way like, like, like the other one blows a tire or something off the line. What about 2006's or six or eight i forget death proof where we get the 70 challenger driven by like zoe bell yeah. and uh, uh sydney poitier and all that <laughs> the lady sydney poitier I don't know. <laughs> so if we're if we're gonna do it if we're gonna do it as a drag race and we got kowalski in lane number one jason priest is out he just got thrashed yeah, so you, yeah. this yeah. next challenger pulls up in lane number two i think it's another thrashing by the original challenger from vanishing point with kowalski behind the wheel because of the originality of that film because of its epicness i mean it's got a cult following anything else we bring to the line with the challenger outside of maybe fast and the furious six or seven or 12 or 14 how many (laughs) however many gear shifts they use in a quarter mile is the only thing that might stand up to it but i think kowalski wins every time yeah. Is, yeah. So going back to Death Proof real quick, because one, Eric, I think you're wrong. So is this the Quentin Tarantino double feature Death Proof? Yeah, for the Great yeah. House double feature. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So so that one wins for sure because of the story <laughs> and everything. And I think that movie's awesome. Honestly, yeah. this is an unpopular opinion. I did not like the original Vanishing Point. I was bored to tears. Oh. I fell asleep like two or three times. Uh, so I'm not gonna lie. I am sort of with you entertainment value wise it's not the highest but i respect it the way that i respect like citizen kane yeah um, <laughs> it's not what i refer wow. to as like a, uh, it's not I think... what I refer to as like a popcorn movie it's like yeah put it on i'm gonna watch it i'm gonna consume it i'm gonna enjoy it but i so appreciate what it did for car movies and the industry mm-hmm. and everything and yeah the the second one is sort of like the remake of psycho did we need it is it a bad version? No, but did we need it at all? Vigo only plays two characters. He plays Stoic and he plays a wooden board that everybody else acts around. <laughs> and he kind of went wooden board in this one. I swear well, I, I saw a wooden board with the same name at Ikea once. Right? <laughs> well, I have to say, we have to time stamp this episode because this is the first time in human history where Banishing Point has been compared to Citizen Kane. Right. Uh, that's true. <laughs> that is a first. <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, you know, it's like yeah, I respect Easy Rider, but Torque and or Biker Boys is so much better because it takes it that next level. <laughs> Biker Boys. <laughs> uh, new kids, and you know it. <laughs> right. Death Proof wins this race, and it's not even in it. I think yeah. it's a bracket race and they all come in at the same time because that's the way it works. These these two Honda Civics are running and then the death proof <laughs> charger comes barreling past them on the highway and laughs as it drives by. All right, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. Somebody put a blower on that Challenger and that's why it's winning compared to the other two normally aspirated 71 Charger RTs. All right, let's go oh, with yeah. that. With five cylinders. Comes out of nowhere. Plow! Race over. <laughs> Next up to the line in the left lane is Mel Gibson, 1979, Ford Falcon XBGT from Mad Max, and Tom Hardy and Charlize Theron in the 2015 remake of Mad Max. Very oh, my heart. <laughs> I love all of them so yeah. much. I'm going to make it even closer. Let's go Road Warrior versus Fury Road. Because Okay, the, the original Mad Max, 1979, Love the Aussie movies from the 70s. So many great yeah, stuff. Definitely just a, an Ausploitation movie, 100%. Yeah, it, it's fantastic. The story of it's basically Mel Gibson's a cop in, is it post apocalyptic or just outback Australia where the law really doesn't mean much? <laughs> All of the above. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that's just the outback. That's just how it is even today. I mean, if you yeah. watch Top Gear Australia, it's like an episode of Mad Max. <laughs> yeah, there we go. But then when we get to Road Warrior, then it's yeah. like, okay, this movie, this this is a world now. Same this car is... though, same car. So yeah. same okay, car and same limp. He's got the same limp. And He's doing a stanky same... leg. <laughs> <laughs> and then Fury Road's just probably the best movie I've seen in ten years. Steve, easily. who was my favorite character when we came out of watching Fury Road? Oh, the War Rig. It was the War Rig. The War Rig, absolutely. Yep. <laughs> That truck is phenomenal. 
<laughs> the thing that gets me about that, though, is they would have been the bad guy cars in the original Mad Max trilogy. The, yeah. We're pulling up to the line with basically an armored truck or a tank against this Ford from Australia. So how do we compare that, right? Because I guess the equivalent... Derby. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, Mad Max Demo Derby. <laughs> Remind me, how did the cars end up? Didn't it get destroyed in Fury Road? The Uh, the, the, Yeah. The the Falcon. uh, Well, the Falcon survived two and a half movies, right? Because it was there at the beginning of Thunderdome. Thunderdome. And then he abandons it. So I would say longevity-wise, it lasted longer than the uh, the war wagons and all that kind of stuff what happened to those vehicles in fury road uh, i'm trying the to remember war rig. oh they blow it up oh, no yeah, yeah that's right the uh yeah. the, the, in the beginning or whatever the wild boys or whatever catch up to them and take them to the prison or whatever and i assume they dismantled it or something yeah right? at the, the end of the movie remember they sacrifice it to get away oh shit that's right that's the one that blows yeah. up at the end yep. yeah because yeah, yeah. okay. like i legit almost cried yeah that's right <laughs> <laughs> that wonderful 3D moment where you got like the steering wheel coming yeah, at the screen. And my because my husband leaned over and was like, they always kill your favorite character. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So Brad, let's let's think about that. Is that a forfeit on the part of the new movie because the vehicle didn't survive? I guess we're not lumping in all like the trilogy, the Mad Max trilogy, just the first movie. Because well, technically the second movie, movie. Road Warrior is the second movie. I mean, yeah okay because because if we're throwing in thunderdome then it's like schrodinger's cat we don't know if the car survived or not <laughs> <laughs> so we bring in the gyro captain yeah <laughs> the gyro copter i mean i think at the race world the falcon wins there's the coolness yeah. factor there the, the cult classic side of oh, it from just a car sorry, perspective the war rig doesn't have a coolness factor no you know why <laughs> because eric banna makes the falcon super cool when you watch the movie love the beast because he owns one of those xb gts and that just brings the the wow factor to like 11 but Charlize like, theron like actually like owns a war a war rig <laughs> If we're going by coolness, wouldn't the real winner be the guy with the flamethrower guitar and the speakers behind him? Yes. Yeah, yeah that's true. That the giant speaker cool. truck. That guy, yeah. Mm-hmm. Guitar Gamp wins for coolness. <laughs> 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 and see, I say that, and you all know exactly who I'm talking about. Yeah. And then that same character ended up in that Jack Black video game that was all about like death metal and they had vehicles <laughs> like that. How do we run this race? Which is better? Well, I mean, the War Rig gets its Academy Award nomination because she sacrifices herself to save the others. So that's true. <laughs> Best, Best actor, supporting actress. Supporting actor, yeah. <laughs> but as movies go, they both again kind of have their place in history in a way because yeah. that yeah. that whole Mad Max trilogy had been untouched, and then we know that Mel Gibson became persona non grata in Hollywood, like a lot of other people recently, and then they decided to redo it. It was a big wow factor there. So I'm wondering if maybe this is a draw. We'll say they're in different race classes or something. So yeah, yeah. It's a- yeah. <laughs> the win has to go to the original because people still talk about the original. People don't talk about Fury Road unless you bring up Fury Road. Um, That's okay. a valid point. I bring okay. it up every week. No, I was going to say, somebody <laughs> doesn't listen to very many movie podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> or somebody, and somebody definitely didn't go to Comic Cons, you know, in the full full time, because there's tons <laughs> of Furiosa fan art out there. Are there it's a awesome. lot of war rig uh, cosplays out there? Oh, that'd be great! Oh my I'd god, like I would see that. It's the new conga line. I mean, we have <laughs> we we have Mad Max furry roads featuring Whoa, Furiosa. That's a different con. <laughs> on on our wall, it is Mad Max's cats with the war rig in the background, and next to that is our artwork, Clever Wives, where it's the war rig and all the wives have been replaced with velociraptors. So they talk about Fury Road all the time yes. the rest of the world is like what yeah we and the cool cats talk about favorite room non-stop but no so i'm thinking i i don't know i we gotta we gotta figure this out i'm, I'm feeling like two points to the vintage lane one and maybe one point to lane two right now like the old movies are winning and we're competitive we like to keep yeah, score well if vanishing point didn't win old or new i mean that death proof won that race that's what I'm saying. Yo, but Death Proof is considered new, so we're putting that in lane two, right? So that's one point for new. Since we brought up the majestic Charlize Theron, why don't we just slip right into the DMs of the Italian mm. job? Woo! I love these movies. Yeah, they're both pretty good. Mike O'Kane <laughs> and Marky Mark. Marky Mark and the fucking bunch. <laughs> 
and I've said it before, and I said it on the episode with Brian, I was like, I have a soft spot for Michael Caine, and it's going to be one of those soul-crushing moments when we get that notice that says, you know, Michael Caine has has left us, right? And, and that, I had that same moment when Ron Williams passed and a couple other people, and I'm just like, oh, oh God. Yeah, exactly. And you're just like, oh, it's like, it's just, it's earth shattering. Any Michael Caine movie for me gets mad props. I'm like, I think he's excellent in everything he's done. I haven't seen a bad movie yet. Even so, Alfie. So Jaws of Revenge good. is your favorite Best Jaws movie? Oh, 100%. 100%. Anything with Michael Caine, I am on board. So, but the Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch version of the Italian job with what's Seth Green. Edward Norton, Jason Edward. Statham, yeah. Most Def. And whoever that random guy they called Wrench. That was supposed to help out handsome rob but like who was that dude right <laughs> <laughs> but you know i recently rewatched this film and it's got some definite replay value right it's a lot of fun that is but a it, super fun one it's a lot like gone in 60 seconds that way like it, maybe even a little more so just because it's a little more uh a little more stylized i guess i don't know it's of its time yeah. Well, it's a little bit more James Bond. I feel it's got this espionage feel to it yeah. versus like your classic Michael Caine film where it's like, all right, guys, here's the plot. We're going to go rob a bank and yes. they, rob, they rob a bank and that's the end of the movie. You know, you're like, all right, whatever. Yeah, it's a lot like Ocean's Eleven kind of. Definitely exactly. Ocean's Eleven yeah, yeah. vibes. Yeah, it's exactly. a heist movie. Yeah. One's a job movie and one's a heist movie. That's true. I did like, and I don't know if you guys picked up on this, because again, I recently rewatched this with kind of new eyes, all the little hints and little clues and little throwbacks to the original movie. One of the obvious ones, Charlize comes out in an original mini, which by the way, was a classic mini, but a relatively new one, if you look at the interior, because they built those alongside of the next generation minis right up until the early 2000s and whatnot. Oh, okay. But there was some, also some other hints. They talk about, Oh, just like we did in the Italian job, you know, referencing, you know, not even just the beginning of the movie with Donald Sutherland and all that kind of stuff, but even the original movie, but one of them that got me and you got to pay really close attention. There's a scene where Marky Mark and Seth Green are doing a like surveillance and they're looking across the street from another building into this guy's like apartment and they're watching it and they're like, Oh yeah, blah, blah, blah. And all this guy does is he's like watching TV and, and on the screen is Michael Caine and you have to see it through the blind. So that's one of the other little kind of subtle, you know, nods back to the Easter original eggs. movie. Yeah. And I thought Easter it was super eggs. cool. So it's full of stuff like that. If you're really like kind of nerd out on it, it's a, it's a lot of fun. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Say it, it's been a while since I've seen the original, but we watched the new one, what, a month or two ago? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's a lot of fun. I can give it that. Super, super fun. And then in Hobbs and Shaw, they have an Italian job reference when they go into hiding and Jason Statham has his like his burner cars and there's a mini and they mention like, yeah, it's for a job, just a little job. (laughs) (laughs) I will say in the original movie, the heist part of it and the whole, you know, the way they orchestrated the traffic lights and all that kind of stuff, that was kind of cool. It was different. It was part of that, just the making of that film. The acting was what it was for the time, and it was good. Michael Caine, Sir Michael Caine, right? He always does a great job. And I think there's two big moments in that film. One is the chase scene itself, you know, through the tubes and they're rocking the car, doing, you know, running through the buildings and all that it was super cool. But it wasn't overly exaggerated. Like the cargo payload that they were moving in those old Austin minis wasn't literally 2,700 pounds like they were trying to do in the new movie. So yeah, yeah. the realism was a little bit more acceptable, I think, in the old film. For me, it wasn't, you still have to suspend disbelief, but it wasn't like over the top exaggerated. The other big moment in that film is actually the end of the movie. Mm-hmm. where you know they're celebrating and then they everybody's cheering and whatever and then they turn the bus sideways and then they're hanging off the cliff and they literally leave you in a cliffhanger and you're like okay whatever but in the second movie there's just so many things where you're like uh really i know i've driven those cars i've instructed in those cars they can't do that <laughs> <laughs> well but they talk about how they retrofit them yeah yeah it's uh, like, they do oh, the yeah the suspension's line. been uploaded so we can load the 2700 pounds and yeah. you know they have that little course they've been you know, practicing their drifting on and yeah, all that stuff. Yeah, we upgraded and, steering the suspension on these. They're not you know. like your regular ones. 
and and I, yeah basically takes it to the realm of okay and now they're all batmobiles or whatever yeah yeah, yeah exactly yeah. exactly like i like that trope that's why i like the fast and furious movies you have the one throwaway line like don't worry about it i modified it and then yeah. it's like yeah i have a fucking batmobile now and i, I mean, modified it now i got magnets <laughs> <laughs> i like that trope in movies and i love the trope where one character doesn't speak any english and everyone understands him perfectly those are two of my favorite tropes in movies. <laughs> that was in the Fast and Furious too, right? The two dudes with the, the trash truck and I forget yeah, which yeah. which one it is. Uh, like Leo and Braga or something. Yeah. Exactly. Now, I will say this. I have to give mad props to the sound engineers in the new movie. One of my major pet peeves with car films is them basically just regurgitating soundtracks from other cars and they don't mash up. And classically, a lot of TV and film, and I mentioned this on the episode with Brian, they tend to steal the sound of a 911, which is extremely distinct. Flat six has a weird sound. The one thing I got to give to this movie is they actually used the sounds of a proper mini. You hear the supercharger whine, it's a four banger, even the shots from the outside, it's got that raspiness to it. I'm like, cool, they did it right for a change. It's not like a Hemi V8 and we're looking at these little go-karts running around in LA. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Terrible. It drives me nuts. Like, so I was, I give mad props, major points to this movie for that. We live on a mountain road and if somebody's exhaust or muffler is loose, every car can sound like it's got a V8 in it. <laughs> or a trash truck, one or the other. <laughs> now I am disappointed that they didn't make a sequel to this movie. And I had heard rumor of the title. Do you guys remember what that was? The French job. You'll like the it. The blow job. <laughs> yeah the space job the brazilian job Ooh. <laughs> <gasps> and that's a uh, fast and furious five, yeah, fast five. Still the bank <laughs> yeah that's just the end of fast and furious five <laughs> exactly right so it all comes full circle it comes Jesus full circle finally got to go to brazil <laughs> I'm thinking we got these two minis at the line revving their motors all you know less than 200 horsepower that they make combined I think my vote goes to lane number two for the new movie because it's much more fun. It has a ton of replay value. You really have to be into old films to really like the original Italian job and watch a Michael Caine movie on repeat. So I'm thinking my vote goes there. What about you guys? Oh yeah, I'm for the second one. Again, I, I love the original one and I love that all the Easter eggs are in the remake. Like that makes the remake even better for me. But yeah, the second one... The second one's just got the high entertainment value. And imagine how fast those cars can go once you take all that gold out. Right? You can probably like drive up the side of a building or something. Like, <laughs> They're going to borrow for the Fast and Furious universe. Yeah, magnets, baby. Yes. To use a drag racing term, I think we could give lane number one, the vintage mini, 15 in the kick, and that new car is still going to beat him. Either well, way. he's got a broken axle. <laughs> <laughs> one wheel drive mm -hmm. since we've been talking about both michael kane and jason satham there's two movies that are, we're going to kind of unpack here which are also car adjacent movies i think i just want to start with a, yet another michael kane movie and this one is a little different but staying with the whole heist idea gangsters you know all that kind of stuff and that's get carter I think this is a lesser known and underappreciated film. And a lot of people don't realize there's actually a remake of this movie in 2000 with Sly Stallone. So pulling up to the line is both of the Get Carters. Hey guys, I I'm going to be honest. I haven't seen either. I didn't oh. know Get Carter was a remake until like three years ago. Blasphemer. Is Get Carter. Like it's not like get mustang or something like i didn't all i knew about get carter was yeah there's a stallone movie about it and i think he's a gangster or something like i completely lost interest as, from the trailer i had no idea it had anything to do with cars okay hold on hold on i'm gonna nerd out for a moment get ready you guys can come back in 10 minutes take a pee break whatever but <laughs> the original movie is based on a series of books which are excellent. And so they made this original film with Michael Caine and Michael Caine is the good guy gangster, right? His brother is killed. It's tied up into all this kind of stuff and he wants to exact revenge. So he goes on this, you know, 90 minute tirade of going after people and hunting down who the killer is and this whole kind of like the prisoner's way, who is number one and who do you work for? You know, that kind of like just vibrato, right? 
like all films of that era, especially European films, it ends tragically. So I don't want to give away the ending. Put it this way. There are some really interesting car chase scenes in that movie. There's with some vintage British cars. You've got a Sunbeam Alpine. You've got a Jaguar XJ and they're chasing around some stuff in a parking garage. It's kind of cool. And then I will spoil this part. Spoiler alert. That uh, one of the characters, he knocks her off literally off of a pier and uh, you know takes out his revenge by keeping her locked in the trunk as the Sunbeam sinks into a into a lake the interesting part about the new movie is it kind of took everybody by surprise kind of like you know stallone did oscar and you're like what what is this about it's like clue right but kind of set to a musical but not and tim, tim curry's in both of the films and so it's the same premise it's the same story but it's t- it's it's much grittier it's much darker it's actually much more graphic and it gets your attention but what nails you right away is the soundtrack And most of the soundtrack is done by like Mint Royale. It's a lot of like techno and synth wave and stuff like that. And it really draws you in because it's the soundtrack is designed to go with the action in the film. But what's really cool about this, and if you really nerd out on the film, you realize that Michael Caine is in the second movie and he plays the opposite role in the remake. Right. So that makes it super cool. And it makes a tie in back to the original film. Awesome car chase scenes in that movie. Sly Stallone is behind the wheel of a Cadillac DTS. So it's a DeVille and it's a Jaguar that he's being chased after just like in the original movie. So it's yet another tie back, yet another throwback to the original film. And unlike Vanishing Point where it's like, nah, okay, the acting's actually really good. The soundtrack is good. It keeps you engaged. I've showed it to a bunch of people and they're like, wow, I didn't even know this film like was a thing. And then they get hooked. For me, I, I really enjoy this and I think it's awesome and I can't recommend it, you know, enough. The new one streaming on Hulu, so we'll definitely have to check that out. And uh, yeah, definitely. The, old, the old one's on like Amazon for like four bucks. So exactly. but I gotta say, I think we have a third contender that's gonna <gasps> pull up since we've mentioned Sylvester Stallone oh, yeah. and Vintage Cars, one of our favorite Stallone movies with a spectacular car, Cobra. Oh, I knew you were going there. With the 50 Mercury Monterey? Such a terribly bad, good movie. It's the best movie where the main character cuts cold pizza pizza with scissors. scissors. I mean, it has all the same tropes as like Commando and, and some of those other ones where it's like, you know, we have to save the damsel in distress. And you're like, oh God, here we go again. But it still has that Rambo flair to it, which I guess kept me engaged when I was younger, but rewatching it now, I don't know. It's kind of cringy. I could watch Get Carter all day long. I mean, like eyes wide shut and I was so I shut uh, clockwork orange style with my eyes, you know, glued open. I, I'd be OK with it. <laughs> I think a better Stallone car movie is Driven. Driven. Yeah. Oh, okay. Winnie oh, Harlan, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me hitting my head on the table? Not, not the Expendables? Any of them? I was thinking you were going there, but Cobra was like my gut reaction, but I thought you were going to go there because he drives oh, that old Chevy we pickup. Can't, we can't do Expendables. They drive motorcycles and planes. And He's always one. got the car at the very beginning and the very end because he's going to bring his personal car in. Oh, yeah, that's right. That yeah. truck is super cool. I mean... Oh, that truck is so good. I mean, it has more skulls than I usually go for in a vintage vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> That was done by the like, guys at Gotham Works Garage. I think they like they love that stuff. So, More yeah. than the like hood emblem or the gear and the gear shift. It's just asking to be pulled over. Right? 100%. I mean, if you can it's catch called it. profiling for a reason. <laughs> what do we think? I mean, I know you guys aren't the experts on this movie, but yeah. based on the way I pitched and positioned this, do you think it's a draw between the two? Like they're both worth investigating and engaging. We'll just call it a zero. It's a no win for either side. Yeah, but they both sound great. I know I haven't seen the second one or the, the remake. I genuinely don't remember if I've seen the first one or not. Yeah, maybe one of those like, wait, was that, am I thinking an Italian job or am I thinking Get Carter? Or right, or Mr. Brown. <laughs> Dirty or... Rotten Scoundrels, could be anything. Yeah. That's true. Jaws 4. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Alfie, you know, whatever. <laughs> oh, yeah, I thought that movie was about an Alfa Romeo and I was severely disappointed when I watched it. But you know, hey, whatever. <laughs> 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 yeah i i would call it a draw we're good so we're tied 2-2 two, two, new versus old i'm okay with that we mentioned jason statham and he's been in a ton of car movies i mean you name dropped fast and the furious hobbs and shaw i mean we gotta say the transporter especially the original oh, one yeah. right expendables exactly i mean <laughs> knives are faster than guns we all know that right yeah yeah <laughs> 
They say bring a knife to a gunfight. Duh, that's a cliche for a reason. One of my favorite scenes <laughs> in that movie was literally that scene where he's like, let's go. You know, there's all these guys, all the terrorists standing around. They're like, what are, what are they arguing about? And the bullets <laughs> and knives start flying. It's fantastic. <laughs> and Dolph Lundgren's just epic too. I mean, come on, you know. He's spectacular, yeah. And then in the sequels, when they talk about like what happened to him, drugs. <laughs> he used to be a rocket scientist. <laughs> you know, he is actually a chemical engineer. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. The coolest he was, he was thing. A chemical engineer that Grace Jones went. Hey, that guy's really good looking. You want to come with me and be in a movie? And uh, then from there. His first movie, James Bond, Beautiful Kill. We could segue for a moment and talk about James Bond. The best James Bond movie, View to a Kill. I have said this on other podcasts. It is the essential oil of James Bond's movies. <laughs> it is every James Bond trope distilled down into its purest form. You don't have to like it, but that is the most James Bond movie that exists. One of Connery's last ones, right? No, that's Roger uh, uh, Moore's Roger last That's right. I thought, okay, okay, yeah. Is he the best Bond? No. Oh, I mean, I like him. <laughs> I mean, We've had debates, though. I, I don't think so. I, I think he's the best Roger Moore. <laughs> <laughs> mean, I mean, there's Roger Moore, then it's like, yeah, it's Roger Moore. Even when he's playing like a Nazi soldier in Escape from Athena, it's like, yeah, that's Roger Moore. You're not yeah, hundred percent, right? Or he's in uh, what was the the Spice Girls movie, Spice World? Right? It's still oh, yeah, Roger Moore. Right? Yeah. Here's my argument: Pierce Brosnan is the best James Bond. He's the epitome of James Bond with the worst scripts. I can do that. The- and Timothy Dalton had the best premise and the worst time as bond right yeah and i'm not gonna lie i like lazenby's i think that we should have given lazenby yeah, did lazenby. you see the documentary on him i haven't seen yeah. that yet oh there's a mockumentary called like the man who would be bond because he only did one bond movie right and yeah, it's it's epic man connery come back yeah and he's he's so funny and it's one of those mockumentaries much like framing john delorean where they brought in actual actors to play out the scenes as he's describing them and i was literally in tears it is so funny and he tells it just so nonchalantly and there's some very touching moments like throughout the mockumentary but if you have not seen it it was on hulu for like forever you definitely got to check it out and who would be bond all right we're adding it to the list i just given you like 12 more episodes now but uh, (laughs) (laughs) oh for july we are doing the 007th month this is our second year in a row doing it Uh, the premise of our podcast is uh bad movies we're going through uh the ones people generally don't love and justifying why really they're all great (laughs) can i tell you what my favorite bond movie is of course never say never again coming in this next month Ah, keep your ear holes open it's coming can i tell you another little bit of trivia so as you guys know barbara carrera the mother of tia carrera she is uh fatima blush in that movie right and do you remember she in that movie there's a chase scene between sean connery because that was the movie he came back for in the 80s to be in and he's chasing her on a bmw motorcycle with all these you know trick gizmos that q puts are on there and all that kind of fun stuff gadgets so that little red car in that movie, it's a French sports car, right? Homologated rally car. It's known as the Renault Turbo 2, right? Mm-hmm. It, it's actually mid-engine and it's actually very quirky and very French. And I got an opportunity to drive one and write a review on that car. It holds status with a few other cars that I've said many times, never drive your heroes. <laughs> and if you want to learn more about that experience, read the article, visit our website. But I, I got an opportunity to drive one of those cars and it, it, it was very interesting. I'll put it that way. Uh huh. It opens up with it's not a Peugeot. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about Statham right and we got a little bit sidetracked about Bond I think to kind of wrap up the whole Bond you know discussion there I think if we lined up all the Bond mobiles and drag race them it would be a hard tie between the original DB5 that Sean Connery had and probably one of the later DBS's that Daniel Craig drove what do you you think Brad? Craig is my favorite Bond Mm. (laughs) obviously the Craig cars for sure. It wasn't the yeah, underwater. He, he's super Lotus? into the uh, the Ford hybrid that they drive through the desert, not Guanab Salas. Oh, yeah. God. <laughs> that Ford Flex or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> the underwater Lotus from Octopussy. You know, that's, that's another great yeah. car. Yeah. Now we're talking. <laughs> no, I actually, I do. My, my favorite Bond car is actually the Z8. That was cool. And they made a handful of those things and they're gorgeous. They are. I've, I've, had, I've had the pleasure of seeing a couple on, you know, like in person. 
and they are just they're stunning to look at. I hear they're terrible to drive, but they're stunning to look they're at. They're also made of unobtainium, and that's yeah. their price on bring a trailer these days, too. So <laughs> that's uh, everything's price on bring a trailer. The uh, moon buggy from Diamonds Are Forever. That's, yes. that's my yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot the moon about that. It's pretty good. <laughs> Uh, I'm, maybe I'm confusing Fast and the Furious with Bond. No, there was a Bond one where they had wings and he flew over a boat, right? Oh yeah, he has the, the little gyrocopter. The um, yeah, yeah. The, so what, uh, what are they call the little, little he, something. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna look it up. Um, is it You Only Live Twice? Yeah, it was the Japanese. Yeah, yeah. You Japan. Only Live Twice. That's yeah, right. uh, but I remember the fun fact about that. It was like like the little Eddie or little Edith or something. Yeah. And they made that. It was a a one person basically a bicycle helicopter they made it for the movie and like british intelligence and u.s intelligence got a hold of the prop guy who made it said does that actually work and he said yeah it really works and they were like you have to make these for us and he made them for them and they made their own versions of stealth things out of it so that was one that started as a prop and became a real vehicle <laughs> so look at that trivia <laughs> it's it's everywhere yeah. <laughs> Fun facts. so since we've done a couple uh donuts there now we're going to talk about statham again right <laughs> <laughs> yeah i am down to talk about statham <laughs> circling circling back just like nicholas cage he's circling back let's go with death race 1975 Yay. david carradine versus 2008 jason statham what do we think that's really hard. Yeah. I have a huge crush on Jason Statham. Mr. Statham, I know you're listening. Uh, go ahead and hit us up on everything I learned from movies. We'd love to interview you because <laughs> I know he listens to this. <laughs> well, we'll make a but, call right now. But the original Death Race is so spectacular. Steve and I had the opportunity in the before four times to host a screening of the original Death Race at our local theater. That is spectacular on the big screen, by the way, guys. Yeah, it's great. Low budget in the 70s, like a million dollars or whatever, but it's like great satire, but also mixed in with some pretty cool car stunts and, yeah. you know, obviously over the top design, kind of like even like pre Mad Max, where it's more like just the crazy, zany kind of like plaster bodies. Yeah, yeah, yeah like yeah. just silly fiberglass bodies. Yeah, fiberglass, but that's it, but yeah. some really good, yeah, they said really good stunt driving. Steve's possibly favorite joke in all of movie dumb it's a hand grenade. <laughs> It catches me every time, too. <laughs> Just when he pulls it out, it's like, oh, God, that's right. I like the Carmageddon style sequence where they're at like the old folks' home and they're like wheeling them out in the wheelchairs and the, <laughs> yeah. the numbers start popping up and stuff. Like we're, what, we're in Pac Man or something. It's craziness. Oh, they wheel out the old folks and then Carradine goes for the nurse instead. Yeah. He <laughs> Uh, yeah, so. it's been a while since i've seen the 2008 one though like obviously you've seen it directed by paul ws anderson before he like exclusively made uh, resident evil movies and stuff <laughs> but i've also seen like all the sequels that starred like dominic purcell and uh, what, what was it 2050 that came oh, out a couple years ago yeah with a bunch of the background guys from fury road oh yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you're you're talking about the new death race right yeah yeah the new the, yeah the new yeah one had, and had i've, I've seen exactly i've seen those two and they're prequels to the jason statham movie which makes them a trilogy because it tells the story of what's his name frankenstein or, frankenstein. or whatever yeah yeah i i really enjoyed them and it, actually for the audience if you haven't seen those prequels those directed dvd or probably vhs uh, or a blockbuster you can pick it up tomorrow i, I recommend <laughs> it i mean they're totally you know, the one blockbuster that's left in the u.s I, I mean i totally recommend them they're super cool because it does fill in the backstory into that almost comic like world that was created around death race oh uh, have you guys seen doomsday superman tubes no okay uh so around yeah, around the same time like 2008 2009 maybe 2010 director neil marshall who did like the descent and like some of the better episodes of game of thrones and stuff okay. like that and then hellboy but <laughs> he did this movie called doomsday and if you like mad max and like the death race 2000 or you know the death race with uh, jason statham i would highly recommend you check out doomsday because it it's like Super mad fun. max without the the trademark you yeah, know. I think I've seen Doomsday. That's the one where they end up in the world of Excalibur and the yes, the, the middle, yes. yeah, okay, medieval times or whatever. Wait, I thought that yeah, was time. Medieval. I thought that was timeline with Paul Walker. Paul Walker, yeah, yeah, yeah. timeline. Yeah. 
I, I don't end up in 13th century France because they time travel using mirrors. Nope, that's a different movie. Dude, that book, I'm a huge Crichton fan. The book is fantastic. The movie that is was one of the, the, the best books. The books are always great. That's why Michael Crichton doesn't let him make movies from him anymore. Like, you guys keep fucking it up. Well, he's also I mean, dead, his, so that doesn't help either. Well, I'm sorry, his estate. <laughs> it's no sphere. Don't worry, yeah. they're nocturnal. They're only poisonous at night. Is that what that means? <laughs> all right, all right, all right. I'm going I'm to say it again because I've said it a million times before. Westworld is amazing. <laughs> Inspired by Crichton in the original movie, Yul Brenner and all that. But still, the new Westworld, fantastic. I mean, it's no runaway, but... Yeah. What can be? <laughs> oh, if you guys have not seen Runaway. Oh. So yeah, Death Race. No. <laughs> <laughs> so circling back to Death Race. I mean, so many circles. They're hard. Yeah, we're we're just doing donuts now. It's like, you know, it's like drift. It's a drift course, not a drag race anymore. But I think the first movie, kind of like Vanishing Point, so the other ones, it holds a place in cinematic history because it was so different, it was so new. It can't be as all get out. But in the same way as the Gumball Run, right? And some of like Raul Julio is in that and, and some other films that were like car related where it's like on these epic journeys and yeah, all that kind of thing. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Death Race is like Waterworld meets Mad Max meets like a bunch of other stuff. And it, I thought it was fun though. And I will rewatch it. I think what's cool about it, unlike the scene in the Italian job <clears throat> with Statham where you know, the guy Wrench comes to help him. And I laughed when I saw that again. And I'm like, who is this clown? Because in my mind, that same scene was played out in Death Race and it was Machete instead, right? And you're like, yeah! <laughs> you know, it's stuff like that is what made Death Race the new one for me because it added that extra level of grit that it just, it just needed to get it beyond, like, this is just kind of dumb and video game-like, where it became fun and rewatchable and something you could just throw on your iPad on an airplane and go, we're going to kill it for the next two hours. Literally yeah. kill it, because that's what they do yeah. in that movie. <laughs> like, like, there the is title. a board game, an unofficial board game for Death Race, and it's super fun. Is this like the jump to conclusions game in Office Space? Like, what are we doing now? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, it's a real Oh, no, no, it's, yeah. a, it's, a real, it's a real game. And what? like, they're... Yeah, so it's a board game. It's sort of set up like the game of life. Like you got the little road you go down. Oh, so it's the sequel to Zathora. I got totally it. Totally set up like little different people. There's the kids, there's the old folks, there's the women, there's the men. You get different points if you can land on their square and hit them. I like this. I gotta find it's, this. It's pretty fun. <laughs> I mean, I get my daughters would get the concept of just ramming into the people with matchbox cars, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, with the, the death races, the, the old one's a classic, but. Really love the old one so much. I love the camp value. The old one's got Carradine. It's got Sly Stallone. It's yeah. got other people in it. The new one, if you took out Jason Statham and replaced him with Nicolas Cage, would it be just as good? Oh, I, no, 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 no. Sta Statham. Statham's, great. Statham's great. Statham's great. Yeah. Statham can stay. I guess what I'm getting at is if you replace the draw of the Statham, the sexiness and the appeal and the British accent, is the movie as good? Is it still a rose by any other name? Oh, Does that sexiness with... bring you in? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It brings all the boys <laughs> to the yard. All right. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I'd rather watch Statham than David Carradine. I'll put it that way. I got so you. I got I'll you. I'll go with the new one. I'll go with the new one. All right. I think I put my points in lane two. What about you, Brad? The new one, for sure. So, so this now puts the new movies one up on the vintage ones. Ooh. Mm. Mm. We got to switch gears a little bit. We're not going to split our car in two or in half or run the rear end past the front end like they did in Herbie. And there have been many sequels to the Herbie franchise. Hey. So pulling up to the line in lane number one is a 1963 WWE Beetle. And in lane number two is a drunken Lindsay Lohan. So <laughs> it's lane one. Let's move on. No. <laughs> <laughs> Although a friend of the podcast, Dana Gould started in one of those Herbie sequels in the nineties, I think. So we all fall on hard times. Yeah, Steve. Right? You gotta some money. <laughs> Everybody's got to keep their sad card up. <laughs> I mean, you're right. 1968, Dean Jones. I mean, the original Love Bug and, and the Herbie movies. I am a big fan of Herbie Goes to Monte Carlo. I just, whatever. I love that movie. I think it's fantastic. The new one, you know, for Herbie Fully Loaded, supposed to pay homage to the original. As much as I love Michael Keaton, and I'm going to say it again, he needs to do Batman Beyond before he, he passes away yes. at some point. Yes. 
right? As Bruce Wayne, he just needs to do it. Yes. Oh my God. I've been screaming this on our podcast for years. I'm so happy to hear somebody yes. else echo it. I posted it on Brian's Take Two Universe page on Facebook. Go back and check it out. I found a picture of Michael Keaton where they grade him and put him in a wheelchair on an episode of Frasier. He was playing a con man. And I snapped it and I said, boom, living proof Michael Keaton can do elderly Bruce Wayne in Batman Beyond. Let's get it done. I put it out yes. in the universe. We'll get Elaine Moosey to play Nightwing. Oh, Right. Come on, really? get your shit together. <laughs> All right, we're going to talk Volkswagens again for a minute. Oh, yeah, yeah. So Michael Keaton, mad props. The man is invincible in my mind. He is Batman. He is a lot of things. Birdman, not so much, but Batman, yes. <laughs> Lindsay Lohan, eh, we could have replaced her with anybody else. The whole cast of Descendants would have been better than Lindsay Lohan in that movie. <laughs> but there's a third Love Bug movie that a lot of people forget, and it stars yet another one of my childhood heroes. Do we know who it is? Is it the chin? The chin, the Bruce. My name is Bruce Campbell. And he starred in another remake in the late 90s. And if you haven't seen this film, have you guys seen this film? Yes, I was in middle school when this came out. So still enough of a kid that I was in the target demographic. Do you remember the importance of this movie? No, because I don't think I have seen it since it came out. All right. Steve, do you know why this movie is important? No. There's two big reasons. It, well, three. Number one, Bruce Campbell's in it. Number two, Dean Jones cameos in the film. And it's supposed to be the Herbie, the original Herbie in that movie. And three, it is the only Herbie film that actually depicts and tells us Herbie's origin story, the entire paranormal background of Herbie. So we get the inside view into all that. And if there's a 3B, they also take a totally Michael Knight spin on this and develop the car. You know, there was Kit and there was Car, the bad version of Herbie. There is a bad version of Herbie in this movie as well, which makes it delightful and entertaining and a complete waste of 90 minutes. But... <laughs> <laughs> getting that origin story is epic and it brings a lot of closure to people going like okay i get it it's disney you know fairy magic and all that stuff why a car why and so when you watch that film then you get that big reveal uh, speaking of big reveal do you know who directed that movie the, the love bug with bruce campbell apparently it was peyton reed the director of ant-man and like several episodes of the mandalorian and mr show with bob and dave and Oh, it's like one of his first movies it looks like he holds that in high regard i'm sure and i'm sure yeah yeah, yeah. It's near the top of the resume <laughs> even disney forgot that it was in the vault they were like man this movie is tragic <laughs> hey, there's a bunch of movies they forgot in the vault do you know how hard it is to find the devil in max devlin is it with you and me and kwan g because i want to talk about my name is bruce <laughs> <laughs> But seriously, let, since you brought up the chin, you know, him and Jay Leno being a big car guy, I mean, they are number one and number two. If we're putting them in lane one and lane two, Bruce Campbell versus Jay Leno, which chin wins the drag race? Uh, oh. Jay Leno by a chin. No, no, no. It's going to be Bruce Campbell because Jay Leno is going to get distracted and go drive off down like the PCH for hours at a time. <laughs> in a steam powered car. <laughs> or a turbine or something ridiculous <laughs> but bruce is going to get stopped by evil dead and zombies and well that and he drives a four-speed tercel that only runs on three cylinders it's not getting very far <laughs> <laughs> and the man's made a whopping out of five thousand bucks in his All right, career so it's, a, it's a it's a three banger tercel versus a stanley steamer <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> so bruce my man bruce if there's hey, any how ho- you're voting for we get it <laughs> I, no 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 i want i want to segue for a moment like we did with bond right we're gonna put bruce on a segue and it's gonna be fantastic frisco county jr himself ah! i think he wrote a segue in burn notice he just got a boner <laughs> i think he just came frisco county jr oh oh god if you had only said jack of all trades it would have been over <laughs> burn notice sidekick <laughs> sam axe for the win so that brings me to the point of what I was getting at here. What's the best Bruce Campbell movie? Oh. Congo. He is pretty good in his five minutes in Congo. Yeah. His the... one day of shooting. <laughs> was it when he played Autolycus in Xena Warrior Princess? Oh, that's right. He was in that. Yeah, he was. Bubba Hotep. Oh, that pustule got its own credit. <laughs> How the hell do you make the mummy worse? 
<laughs> Chubba <laughs> Hotep. They're so bad, but they're so excellent. Every one of them. So much charisma that it is fun to watch him in movies that would be completely unwatchable with almost anybody else in that role. Absolutely. And he could reprise the role of Errol Flynn whenever he feels like it. That's, that's oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I kind of liked his role in Dark Man. Oh, there's another movie with Arnold Vosloo going back to the mummy. Yeah. <laughs> That's a poll right there. Nice job. Like, I don't think a lot of people know he that that's say a word, does he? he just no. Kind of shows up at the so. end, like, yep, that's my new face now. <laughs> With Herbie, it goes to the original, right? Whether it's yeah, Bruce Campbell yeah. or not, I think it goes to the original. So we're tied once again, three, three here. So I'm going to pull one out from underneath a rock. And many people don't realize that the Fast and the Furious is actually a remake of a oh, night. Yeah, Roger Corman, baby, 1954. Yes, John Ireland and Dorothy Malone starring in The Fast and the Furious. And they have nothing to do with one another other than the fact that, no. the fact that there's cars. Towards Mexico. Yeah. Nothing gets airborne or explodes in the original film. There is no danger to manifold and the paint schemes are quite bland. How many shifts? Four speed. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Not I can't even tell you what the car is. It's such an unmemorable film and I have it in my collection. <laughs> The original Fast and the Furious and then Fast and the Furious and then, you know, the 19 other films that came after that. And that's pretty much it. All right. Sorry. I looked it up for uh, Fast and Furious 1954. It's a Jaguar XK120. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's donated right. Donated by a local Jaguar de- dealer. And it didn't run. Uh, well, apparently, they had to pull it uh, with a Chevy. <laughs> apparently, Corman set up a deal that he was going to borrow them, but they couldn't crash any of them. And none of them were able to be returned to the dealership. Interesting. Even back then, look at that. But I think in this case, the new one definitely crushes the old. So one. I think I think for the the sake of this argument, we get rid of the 1954 Fast and Furious. It, it Grandma drives to the track to sit on the sidelines and watch the rest of the young kids race. So okay. now we need to figure out which of the Fast and Furious you know saga is the <laughs> better is the best film. I, th- I think. All right, all right, all right. Hold on, hold on. We're not going to talk about chronology. We're not going to talk about plot holes that you can literally drive aircraft carriers through. Do we count five and six as one movie? Two parts to the same movie? Wait, Fast Five and Fast Six? Yeah, they're two. They're two parts. It's, they're part A and part B. Okay, here, here's here's the thing. Like based on the uh, time frame, like between movies and stuff, the eight movies or whatever that have happened so far, hasn't it been over the course of like three years? I think it's been like two timeline. weeks. <laughs> like, shouldn't Dom's kid be like in the sixth grade or something by now? Or? It's like an episode of 24. <laughs> That's what you don't realize. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically. <laughs> if we are going to pit Fast and Furious movies against each other, the reason I want to bundle five and six together, because they really are one big four hour movie, because that's the, the sequence I would pit against any of the other films, whether it be the original one, Tokyo Drift, Fast and Furious 4, that's got two flat tires and a busted turbo. That's on the side of the the track. It's not even running. (laughs) But even the newer ones, right? I'm thinking five and six together because I can't put five and six against one another. You know what I mean? But what would you put up against that movie or movies? Well, everyone knows Hobbs and Shaw is the best, but as far as like driving the cars, oh, I think it was seven that had uh, the bad guys had the those cars that were like the basically like Indy cars or whatever, but they yeah. were, you know, death proofed out or whatever. And mm-hmm. I don't know, some sort of jet engine slash magnets. I don't know what, By but way, <laughs> made him like invincible. We got to remember too, that this franchise starts out with uh, a brother and sister who own a sandwich shop and drag race on the weekends. Also fund their sandwich shop by stealing Zune players out of the back of semi trucks driven by Hercules himself. That's right, Kevin uh, Sorbo. Kevin Sorbo drives the uh, the big rig. I also want to throw out there with the the adding of the Rock and Jason Statham to the Fast and Furious universe. Steve and I discovered an Easter egg. Ooh. that we don't know if they're going to fully cash in on, but they've already started to, in Tokyo Drift. Han is not dead. Han is not dead, but but it gets better than that. In Tokyo Drift, when they have the last race against the Yakuza, when Sonny Chiba is going to kill everybody if they don't win the race, <laughs> which is already amazing in itself, Twinkie, little Bow Wow, is live streaming the race on his flip phone because Japan, they're in the future, why not? And he says to his phone, yo, Uncle Deck, check this out. Then they bring in a character named Deckard Shaw, who we find out from Hobbs and Shaw was basically brothers with Idris Elba. 
who Ooh. supposedly died a few years ago because Jason Statham had to put him down. So is Uncle Dick Deckard Shaw is Bow-Wow. to Bow Wow, and that's how they're going to bring him back into, I don't know, Fast yeah. Ten. Is, is, is Bow Wow in the Japanese international uh, prep school because his dad died in the line of service? You guys have just blown my mind <laughs> in like the whole NBC, the more you know sort of way. I'm like, holy <laughs> smokes. And you guys can go back and rewatch it. We have replayed that scene so many times we wore a DVD out, I'm pretty sure, because we want to make sure we heard what we heard and I'm we heard what we heard. I mean, that's like me watching My Name is Bruce and pausing when they go to the trailer full of his stuff and I'm playing I Spy, you know, inside the room to figure out which show is in there. Wow. No, I am. My mind is blown. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. my valves are bent and my manifold is melted at this point. Well, because the first one they bring Jason Statham in, they go back to Tokyo Drift with him, quote unquote, killing Han. And then they've sort of skipped over i'm hoping and then they explain it more about how actually deckard was helping out han i'm guessing to escape the yakuza so interesting i'm we'll we'll see what they do with that we'll see what they do i mean once the franchise has hit 90 movies i'm sure they'll do a tv show on like hallmark channel and it'll be fantastic and you know we'll just love it for the next 50 years so whatever live and love a quarter mile at a time guys this potentially means that there's a movie out there with jason statham idris elba and han in their like early days like a prequel that is true and they all know each other apparently if you had to pick any two people from the Expendables to be in the Fast and the Furious, which is basically Expendables with cars, who would you pick? Well, we've already got Jason Statham, so yeah, there we, we go. Got, we already got the good But one. two more, two more. You're going to pull two more. more. Dolph Lundgren and Terry Crews, though. I mean, let's face it. That's yeah. that's who else we need was, in this franchise. I was thinking Terry Crews and Jean-Claude Van Damme. <gasps> Jean-Claude <gasps> is pretty good. Jean Vlaine? Yeah. <laughs> he only gets to drive French cars, though. <laughs> he, he gets to ride on top of a Volvo no. rig. He gets the brown Volvo from Jalopnik. That's what he gets to drive. End of story. <laughs> so a lot of people will argue that Tokyo Drift is probably one of the best movies in the franchise. So do we put that in lane number two Who against the maybe the original? Read? I've heard it said before. I've I, been told. I've heard it said as well. It, it's it's pretty good. I thought it was straight to DVD, but apparently it made like $200 million in theaters. <laughs> Everybody thought it was straight to DVD, it, and yet it made a shit ton of money. Here's the thing. The main kid, not a great actor. The no. plot, very interesting. The side characters, very interesting. When you rewatch it, you can sort of look past the, our main characters, sort of a nothing, because the rest of the movie's very good. It was so good, it brought Vin back. Right? He do was like, you... oh no, I'm about to lose another franchise. I need to come back. Triple <laughs> X isn't working out for me. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's the same movie. I'm like, come on. It's so like, Fast and Furious. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I don't want to talk about give it Sean. to Furious 6. Sorry, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> so over on our podcast, during the lockdown, we actually did quarter April at a time. And we did Ooh. review every single Fast and Furious movie because we were just making content, including the Roger Corman one and Hobbs and Shaw and the entire universe. So nice. we're well versed in this. So, I mean, there's so many other films that we could talk about that aren't sequels from the same general era and genre of car film, right? The French Connection, To Live and Die in LA, The Seven Ups, Bullet, Le Mans, Grand Prix, even Rendezvous. If you've never seen that, you should check it out. Probably one of the I don't want to say the oldest car films, but it's right up there with no redeeming dialogue, but lots of action. We need a tiebreaker here, right? I think we're still like three all, if I remember, and we need we need something to break it up. To throw out a movie, we'll just go for it. And that's that's going to be it. What, what's it going to be? Congo. No. I, wait, wait. <laughs> what, 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 like yeah, an action, action car movie yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah well i mean whatever we gotta throw i mean we're tied three all we got it we gotta settle this old versus new do the sequels win to the modern movies kick ass tonight mm-hmm. or do we hand it to the, the vintage guys you know loping away with their big v8s wait was it fast and furious the tiebreaker <laughs> so it's got to be the new ones <laughs> we you, yeah we never got a definitive answer he's just throwing out 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, uh, Fast and the Furious is like, are we drag racing or are we demolition derby at that point, right? I mean, they're just all crashing into each other. And, and it depends shit. on which movie you're talking oh, about. It's, yeah, it starts out <laughs> with their drag we'll, racing. We'll keep it with the first three where, yeah, it's like racing. So, so they start out. They start out as racers. They become sort of demolition derby guys. Then it becomes a car superhero franchise. <laughs> so now we're into car superheroes. I think they've been disqualified for cheating, and we need to find a better tiebreaker. <laughs> Let me think. Let me Look, think. you're just mad because they drove between two towers in Dubai. All right, the van and A team, old versus new. <laughs> Oh, that's a good pull. That's a good pull. I like that. The I just remembered that there was a new A-team and it was like, yeah, there we go. <laughs> no, I, I forgot about that movie. And the sad part is I really like the new movie and I think I think it's really good. It's basically the same van. So is it really, or, or I guess we got to compare the movie now because the vehicle's the same. We, we pull them up to the Christmas tree. They're, they're going to run the same lap time. So what are we thinking, Brad? Old A-team, as cornball as it was, you know, I love it when a plan comes together. Or the new stuff. Cornball, I'm glad when a plan comes together. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to stick with my millennial roots and say the new one. Ooh. I got to go with the new one because it has John Hamm in it, even yeah. as a cameo. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, it's a, it's a good little action movie. I'm surprised it didn't make sequels, but I guess it didn't make a whole lot of money. Like, I'm trying to remember like the old uh, A Team episodes, and I just remember them being very repetitive. Like, it's always like, Hey, we got to go into this compound, and then you get this. Like, how are we going to sneak in? I don't know, but I've got a plan. And then it ends up like the van's on like a hot air balloon and goes over the fence, and then they shoot, get the hostages, and shoot their way out. Ha ha ha! Freeze frame created by Dick Wolf or whatever. It's like. <laughs> <laughs> know, who's, the, who's the guy? Uh, Rockford Files, uh, Jerry Cannell. Or yeah, something. exactly, exactly. <laughs> And we actually talked about Dick Wolf. He was part of a, a movie that we reviewed in our movie mix bag episode. So go back and check that out. It's actually a lot of fun. That stars uh, D.B. Sweeney and Charlie Sheen in that film as well. So I, I get your point about the A-Team and people are going to hate me for saying this, but I always put it into this category of it's just like Voltron. And people are like, what the hell are you talking about? It's just like Voltron. If you go back and rewatch the old episodes of Voltron, not the new stuff on Netflix, which is actually really, really good, you'll realize very quickly that there's only about 37 seconds of new content in every episode of Voltron. And it's just canned stuff repeated over and over again. And that's how I feel about like the A-Team and Hawaii Five-0 <laughs> and like Gilligan's Island and all those old shows. It's like, all right, what's the new little piece that we're adding to the same old crap we've been watching over and over again? I can see it. All right, yeah. Time Breaker movies too. I'm going to throw another one out there for you guys. Ooh. Smokey and the Bandit. <gasps> the original oh. three versus the four they made for uh, country music television. Yeah, good old CMT. Directed by Burt Reynolds, apparently. Ooh. 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 <laughs> I mean, it's hard to go against the original Smokey and the Bandit. <laughs> what you didn't like, Bandit, 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 or Bandit Goes Country, or? But then they had on what became the CW, right? They had the Bandit television show where he drove a Dodge Stealth, and that was absolutely horrendous. I can't remember the actor's name because I don't think he did anything else. His career tanked after that. But that was along with all those other shows that they were they were having at the time, like name with, is Hugh uh, Jackman. What? what? No! <laughs> Blasphemer. <And laughs> do not sully. Thy hot sue charade. Do, Wait, do, not, do not sully the name of, of Hugh. He apologizes for making Wolverine, but the, other than that, his, his career is completely unblemished. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> you read about that one, didn't you? <laughs> oh, that's terrible. <laughs> Uh, smoking the banner i mean the original one was awesome i have i didn't like the second or the third movie and i oh, and i love like the elephant <laughs> uh, we'll get that some bitch but you know i, <laughs> I don't know there's something in pursuit come on anus <laughs> so apparently the third one oh my god my jackie brain gleason. jackie gleason was supposed to play every single character right including right. the bandit but he got sick, you know, right during filming, so they couldn't do that. I don't think it would have been a better movie. Nope. Wasn't that the one where Cletus, aka the snowman, introduces to us to Fred and his girlfriend Frida? Yes. Yep. <laughs> That's the most memorable part of that movie for me. 
But could you imagine if every single character was Jackie Gleason? That's like a simple Jack, right? That, that's how I would view that turning out at the, <laughs> the end of that film. <laughs> it just like, it wouldn't have been better, but it would have been interesting. It would have been a piece of cinema. <laughs> it would have been a piece of something. You're right about that. <laughs> So, so the old one wins, right? The original. I, I, I think so. I really do. So, I mean, we're tied yet again. You know, new A-team, old Smokey and the Band. I think we just keep going back and forth. But we're having a lot of fun doing it, right? Our <laughs> movies are awesome. They need to make a come. Okay, the Fast and Furious movies, fantastic. Although yeah. half of the stunts and everything in it are CGI. We need more Mad Max Fury Road type shit. Yeah, we need real, real cars car just banging and just people jumping from car to car yeah. and hood to hood. And Let's break the truck jump record. Where's Hal Needham when you need him? Ray <laughs> Parker Smith is still alive. Let's make this happen. Come on, Australia. You know what's up. Now a movie podcast. Sorry, gearheads. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> people don't watch Tucker because they want to find out about how a guy bankrupt the car company. <laughs> so you watch that i watched i read an article about that movie with uh with that which had jeff bridges from tron hey, hey. so uh because we're on the car podcast i have to brag a little when i was a kid my dad was an antique automotive mechanic his oh. specialty was pre-world war ii cars and he worked on not one but two tuckers and that i got to ride both cool. of them for the test drive what was it like riding in a helicopter engine powered rear wheel drive monstrosity? <laughs> Honestly, it was sort of like driving in it, it, riding in any car from like the 20s or 30s, but I was also like six. So. Oh, <laughs> well, there you go. And, and you know, he did have one of those Stanley steamers and he would take it apart and just store it in the garage until somebody asked him if it could be in a parade and he'd spend three days putting it back together. Nice. And you know what? I know how we're going to wrap this episode up. I think we're going to do it break fix style, Brad. Why don't we ask them a couple pit stop questions while we're at okay. it? Okay. I'm down. Do I you guys down toilet paper. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> pit stop hack number one. <laughs> Are we talking NASCAR pit stop or Formula One? <laughs> oh, road trip. I I was thinking run down a Valero station in the middle of Nevada. <laughs> you just reminded me of Rat Race where uh, <laughs> the girl's like... <laughs> She, she hangs her ass out the window. Dad, I gotta go! <laughs> I'm prairie dogging it. Oh, so good. That and Sex Drive, where, where the girl has to fill the radiator on the side of the road. Oh, that scene is incredible. But no. <laughs> What's the best looking car of all time? Ooh, best looking car. Sexiest. I like the like 69, like Le Mans, Chevelle, like that kind of muscle car body that's my favorite nice nice uh i'm super 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 biased because one of these has been on my mom's side of the family in the family for well almost 100 years now uh i really like a 36 ford cabriolet oh that's a good pull that's the first time somebody's gone that far back mm -hmm. that's awesome that's a good looking car i agree and so when we flip that on its nose ugliest car of all time we're talking ugly. We're talking fugly. Uh, I mean, 1987 Ford Mustang. Anything oh, Scion. Hatchback. Anything Scion. Yeah, oh, we whoa. Go. Whoa, 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 we got a Fox body on one side and we have a Toyota Corolla basically on the other side. Wow. No, no, no. Toyota Corollas are beautiful. This is if Duplos had an abortion. I've never heard it referred to that way, but that's, that's great. I love it. <laughs> Stop me when I'm wrong. <laughs> Now, I will say there's people like shaking their fists and, and getting their pitchforks and their torches lit now when you mentioned the Fox Body Mustang, because that, that is sacred. Oh, yeah. that, that's a national yeah. treasure right there. That's like look, look, Crocodile Dundee. You guys got ripped off in the 80s. I, I apologize on behalf of the Ford Motor Company for putting out that shit. I'm sorry. You I, were I, the engines are great, but the body, yeah. No. I thought you were going to say the other thing. Everybody seems to like the body and they go, that 302, five liters of 180 horsepower. What is that? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that is odd, but it's <laughs> oh. so you could have that 5.0 on the side of that horrible body. All right, I'm done. If you could have any one car from television or a movie, what would it be? Ooh. What was that car in Octopussy? No, I'm just kidding. Um... <laughs> you just wanted to say Octopussy again. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, 
this is a that is a tough one. Any car from any can I have the war rig from Fe- yeah, oh, war rig? Uh, I would like a big rig that has gun turrets attached to it and flamethrowers. We used to live in the San Francisco Bay Area. I've sat in traffic. I'd like a big rig. <laughs> like so, so you want you want Optimus Prime is what you're saying. Oh no no no. Oh, no, no she no, she no. wants the war rig like with the, war the rig. Oh oh I know you said semi and I, I just went transformers so I was yeah, like yeah, right, yeah. yeah no 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 I believe the war rig could blow up Optimus Prime. <laughs> <laughs> So it's funny when we had Brian on the show and he mentioned that he wanted the, uh, the dog mobile from Dumb and Dumber. So, you know, that, that's high up on the list there. <gasps> Wait, I, 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 I like put, a I... DeLorean with a Mr. Fusion in the back. Nice. Flex capacitor. And... See, DeLoreans are cool again. I keep saying that, you know. They always were. I want the tank from Tank. <laughs> oh, <it's... laughs> uh, you just want James Gardner's vehicles. Like, I'll take, I'll take the Rockford... Uh... God, what was that, a 72 oh. Thunderbird or something yeah. like that? Yeah, I do. I do like that T-Bird. Nerds! <laughs> now, you know, this pit stop is quickly becoming the uh, the scene with Ogre at the urinal. So we white flag, one lap to go. Now, I guess we're approaching the checker here. Yeah, we passed so, the checker. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do this. I'm going to give Steve and Izzy an opportunity for yet another shameless plug after I thank them for coming on this epic crossover episode. I hope the petrol heads and the movie buffs alike enjoyed this episode and kind of realized how much crossover there is between all these films. And hopefully we presented some films that you haven't seen before in a new way. And you know what? Go bake off some of these films for yourself. It's an easy way to kill, you know, four and a half hours on a, on a Wednesday night. Yeah, well, I, I feel like we've talked about our podcast, everything I learned from movies enough. Uh, babe, are you on social media at all? I am. I'm actually an artist. You can find my art pretty much everywhere under Untidy Venus. That's a goddess who's bad at housework. I'm all over, especially over on Etsy, where I have my own little shop where Steve and I make awesome creations and sell them. That's Untidy Venus. Well, guys, again, thank you so much for our listeners on Break Fix. Be sure to tune in to Steve and Izzy's show. Everything I learned from movies, they are available on all the majors as they plug several times on the show. <laughs> it is delightful. The episodes are a lot of fun. And again, I have to tip my hat to both of you for reaching a number that maybe one day we'll get there. Folks, they are closing in very quickly on 500 episodes i mean that is Ooh, quality ep- over quality <laughs> well, you can't stop us <laughs> you guys are epic you guys are an absolute delight and i cannot thank you enough for coming on the show this has been a lot of fun yeah thanks for having us you'll oh, have to yeah, come on so our much. show when we uh, get car movies coming on yeah. <laughs> hey we're gonna take you up on that we're gonna take mm. you up on that <laughs> oh yeah and by the way the secret to longevity is sleep with your co-host If you like what you've heard and want to learn more about GTM, be sure to check us out on www.gtmotorsports.org. You can also find us on Instagram at Grand Touring Motorsports. Also, if you want to get involved or have suggestions for future shows, you can call or text us at 202-630-1770 or send us an email at crewchief at gtmotorsports.org. We'd love to hear from you. Hey, everybody. Crew Chief Eric here. We really hope you enjoyed this episode of Break Fix, and we wanted to remind you that GTM remains a no annual fees organization, and our goal is to continue to bring you quality episodes like this one at no charge. As a loyal listener, please consider subscribing to our Patreon for bonus and behind-the-scenes content, extra goodies, and GTM swag. For as little as $2.50 a month, you can keep our developers, writers, editors, casters, and other volunteers fed on their strict diet of Fig Newtons, gummy bears, and Monster. Consider signing up for Patreon today at www.patreon.com forward slash GT Motorsports. And remember, without fans, supporters, and members like you, none of this would be possible.